Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and sound and COVID-19 free. <laughs> uh, welcome to FCBF Licensing and Regulation of OTI's webinar. My name is Michelle Fajardo. I am the chairperson of the Freight Forwarding Committee. I am your liaison between the regulatory agencies and Florida's freight forwarders. Please feel free to email any inquiries to education at fcbf.com. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Andrew Margolis, who will be guiding us through the OTI licensing process, OTI compliance, and updating us on recent regulatory changes that will impact OTIs. Andrew Margolis is an attorney. He has practiced law, he practiced law in the 1980s in Miami. He joined the Federal Maritime Commission in 1986, became the FMC South Florida area representative in 1995, and held that position until his retirement just last year in 2019. We are very honored that Mr. Margolis is sharing his vast experience with the Florida OTI community and those who are interested and considering applying for the license. So without further ado, we have here Mr. Andrew Margolis. Thank, thank you very much, Michelle, for that very nice uh, introduction. And thank you, Michelle and Megan, for putting this event together. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying that I'm going to cover the following areas. And each one deserves possibly an hour of time on their own. So I'm trying to pack hours of material into one hour, but I thought it would be a good idea to get an overview. Uh, some, some slides I was able to uh, show an entire um, set of regulations and some uh, because of lack of space, uh, I just um, summarized. So one thing I would recommend is read the regulations in full, read the statute in full, especially the parts that I'm going to highlight today. So I'm going to go through the licensing requirements. Uh, not everyone um, who thinks they need a license needs a license. There are exceptions uh, to the law. To the law. Uh, I will go over how to obtain the license. And then for those who are licensed, uh, there are duties and responsibilities um, that have to be followed. And of, of course, anytime you have a regulation uh, to make people uh, comply, there are always prohibited acts and penalties that are possible to keep everyone in compliance. And finally, there was some very significant regulatory and statutory changes that um, many of which directly impact OTIs and we'll go over those at the very end. Uh, although the FMC has um, a uh, uh, purview over more than just the following um, statute and the Code of Federal Regulations, these are the ones that you really have to focus on as an OTI. In particular, 46 CFR 515, uh, 520, 531, 532. 520, 31, and 32 would be for more for the NVOCCs, uh, 515 for the freight folders. One thing I would recommend is to become very familiar with and very friendly with FMC.gov, the FMC website. You're going to be able to find regulations and statutes and news releases. And one of the reasons you'd want to see the news releases is, of course, to see what the commission is doing now. And also uh, from time to time, there will be a press release on penalties. And what it helps you do is understand what type of actions uh, or prohibited acts the FMC um, has uh, penalized. And most of these will be um, settlements, negotiated settlements. Uh, also on the website is something every uh, steamship line and OTI needs, and that's a a list of licensed OTIs, um, simply because as a common carrier, uh, you will be subject to a prohibited act that um, precludes you from carrying cargo for uh, an unlicensed, unbonded OTI, and you're going to have to verify through the FMC website. That's the easiest way to do it. It's, there's one location that you can go to. Here are definitions of OTIs. OTIs are defined as either a freight folder or an NVOCC. Uh, not everyone, believe it or not, who's licensed over the years, I've noticed, 
is clear about the distinction because there is not a great deal of it distinction except one very important thing. An NVOCC is responsible for the cargo they ship. They issue bills of lading. Uh, usually they should. And um, they are a common carrier in their relationship with the shipper who tenders cargo to them. And they are a shipper in their relationship with a steamship line. The forwarder, on the other hand, is not responsible for the cargo. They're not common carriers. Uh, they are essentially, I would put it this way, travel agents for cargo. Their job is to find uh, and offer uh, an idea of what rates are available from either NVOs or steamship lines, and then book the cargo when given approval by uh, their shipper customer. They also process documents and perform related services. First, who must obtain an OTI license? Any entity in the U.S. that provides freight folder, NVO services in its own name with an exception for agents. A uh, number of years back, um, there was a court case um, that, and, the, and the holding was essentially that uh, OTIs can have agents, but the FMC until recently did not uh, clearly define anything regarding agents in their regulations, and now it's defined better. Uh, also, uh, another exception to licensing is foreign-based NVOs. They have an option of getting licensed, or if they choose, they can just register with the FMC, publish a tariff, and uh, their bond would be double the ordinary requirement, so they would have a bond to post a bond or the surety of $150,000. There are uh, some other exceptions to licensing requirements in 515.4, and this is um, one of the regulations that I abbreviated and summarized. It is not required for shippers, and I put here in parentheses under certain conditions, um, it's not required for shippers who forward their own cargo or those of a parent affiliate, etc. Now, if you have and this often happens, companies start out shipping their own products. It's very often the case with automobiles. They become an expert at the paperwork and then they may be approached from a uh, overseas customer who tells them, I didn't buy from you this time, but could you help move the cargo for me? Could you make bookings, etc." Under those conditions, a shipper hasn't met the exception. It's only for cargo that they own. Also branch offices, employees or agents, and I mentioned agents before, of um, OTIs are not going to have to be licensed. And of course the foreign NVO. The licensing process, uh, this is where I'm gonna recommend everyone go to the FMC homepage and I hope we'll have a few minutes to go over the website because that's where you will find the uh, electronic application. Uh, years ago, a license were all submitted in paper format. That has all changed. And uh, the license fee dropped as well. It's, it, I think it used to be over $800 and application fees now $250 for the OTI license. Um, one thing I would add is if once you apply, there are changes in material facts, you have to report that to the FMC. The fee for changes that I listed um, as the final sentence on this slide um, pertains to OTIs that are licensed. Sometimes there are changes, and I will list them, that have to be reported to the um, FMC 18, which is the application form, and the fee at that time is $125. The requisites are not many to get an OTI license. The application has to be filed with the FMC on their electronic system. The fee has to be paid and every um, applicant has to designate a qualifying individual. And a qualifying individual is someone who, um, although there are a number of um, ways you can apply as a corporation, as a partnership, as a sole proprietor, 99.5% it seemed to me were corporations. So therefore the qualifying individual uh, that set forth on the application would have to be an officer of the corporation. 
a question that often comes up from those who are licensed or actually from qualifying individuals down the road is, and this seems to happen where there's some issue or dispute, the qualifying individual, I have been asked, well, who has the license? Is it my license or is it the corporation? It belongs to the corporation. Here are some additional requisites to become an NVOCC. These are additional requirements that are not there for freight forwarders. Freight forwarders need the first two, $50,000 bond and the qualifying individual. For an NVO, you must also publish a tariff file a form FMC1, which basically sets forth the uh, web address for your tariff and other information. And there are some additional forms regarding your bond. And for foreign registered NVOs, again, bond is double, $150,000. What is the FMC looking for in a qualifying individual? There is, you can find greater detail in 46 CFR 515, but I'll break it down into the main points. They're looking for a qualifying individual that has three years of OTI experience in the United States. That's for those who are being licensed in the United States. And one thing I could add is freight folders can only be licensed here in the US because they deal only in export cargo. So what type of experience? Booking cargo, order, ordering cargo to the port, preparing and pro processing bills of lading. Um, and also good character that will be looked at. Um, things like bankruptcies are looked at. Uh, those that have been discharged generally shouldn't be a problem, uh, but bankruptcies that are still on ongoing could be a problem. Um, criminal record can be looked at, and uh, there are a number of things that will be and can be looked at, uh, and those are listed in the regulations as well. As I mentioned before, Qualifying individual would have to be an officer of the business entity. And a qualifying individual needs to uh, list three different references. Years back when I started, uh, it was a little different and reference letters were required. In some ways, I think that made it a little easier because one problem is if you list three different reference, when you list your references, the FMC has to have a response when they contact them. And, and uh, one of the things I'll add is, and this is always asked, how long does the process take? And that in a big part depends upon the applicant. If your references uh, are contacted by the FMC and they do not respond, that's a problem that's gonna slow down your application. Um, and if your application is not clear or incomplete, that's going to slow it down. The um, Office of Transportation Intermediaries will contact you and let you know um, through the electronic system uh, whether or not there are deficiencies in your application, whether or not a reference is just not responding. You'll have a, uh, a period of time to respond. Uh, if you don't respond in a timely fashion, your application can get locked and the FMC can make you start all over uh, with a brand new application fee. Once you are licensed, there are certain activities or changes that take place that have to be reported uh, to the FMC uh, prior to these activities act or actions taking place. I've listed all of them here that are in 46 CFR 515.20 transfer of a license to another person or entity, change in ownership or sole proprietorship or partnership, any change in business structure, any change in licensee's name, and that is big, that companies do change their name or add trade names without approval. That has to be done um, through the FMC 18 prior to the change taking place. Change in identity or the status of the qualifying individual, this is a very big deal with the FMC and I'll get into um, some of the pitfalls with that a little bit later. And the changes are done through the system on form FMC 18, same as you did with your original application. And there's a filing fee of $125. And changes in material fact must be reported within 30 days. And there are some things that happen, you move, or um, email changes, 
uh, it behooves you to notify the FMC. Number one, it's required by the regulation. Number two, there'll be a time that you need them to contact you and that's when your license renewal is due. And I think we're gonna get into that very soon. Tariffs uh, are required under the uh, statute and regulations. Uh, they're required of all licensed and registered NVOs and of course of steamship, of vessel operating common carriers as well. Uh, there are several sections that I listed here, 531, and NSAs and 532 NRAs. Um, for the purpose of this webinar, it, would, uh, it could be a session in and of itself to go over tariff requirements and, and um, alternatives, but I can just tell you that the um, NVO service uh, agreements and uh, or service arrangements and um, the NRAs for NVO um, arrangements that are really, really easy to work with and arrange your attractive alternatives um, to using your tariff. I think it was NVO rate arrangement. So if the NSA and NRA requirements are met, only a rules tariff needs to be published. Both alternatives allow great effects, flexibility and customization for shipper constantly clients. Uh, I'd have to repeat, they're both easy to use uh, and you could use them even either one or NRAs are really simple and they could be used exclusively when offering rates to customers. They give a great deal of flexibility and you won't have to worry about putting rates in your tariff and uh, updating rates. Who has to file uh, for our purposes today? Um, carriers, be they an NVOCC or a vessel operator have to, have to um, publish a, a file form FMC1, which is the registration form. Uh, you would get to that again on the FMC website. And if you make changes, you have to submit them immediately. Changes could be a change in web address or other matters. Again, I would look at the regulation for a complete list. So now you're licensed and now is when you really have to be aware of what's required of licensees. And the duties and responsibilities are going to begin in 46 CFR 515.14, which covers the issuance, use, and renewal of the license. It requires um, OTIs, and this is about three to four years old, uh, maybe a little less. OTI licenses provided the bonds stayed in effect and provided the FMC didn't uh, revoke them for other reasons lasted essentially a lifetime. Um, but now OTIs are going to have to file a renewal. The reason you need to have your, up, your um, current email is because one of the ways you will know when it's your time is that the FMC will notify you in advance by email. There, are, there is another way and you can do it on the FMC website. You can just have you look at the last two digits of your license number and there are, there are guidelines right on the FMC um, website that will tell you uh, the month and the year your renewal is due. The regulation, um, one of the regulations that covers this is 515.14.3, where the, where the commission regulation states renewal not meant to reevaluate character of licensee, but FMC reserves that right. In fact, they pretty much reserve that right um, Any time, this is the time, actually ahead of time, you should have um, filed an FMC 18 listing any changes that require prior approval. Um, but if you, when you look at your renewal and, and look at what you put down before, and if you forgot to do it, um, prior to issuing or sending in and filling out that renewal, do file an FMC 18 with your changes. When I get, and when the FMC mentions character, that can be a long list of things. So um, I don't believe, and this is my opinion, that the FMC wants to use this as an investigative tool. But when you see that they reserve that right, know that is a possibility. 515.16 recovers license revocation or suspension. 
Uh, commission has the ability to, of course, give a license and then take one away. Automatically, a license will be um, revoked upon termination of financial responsibility. And that is one of the probably by far the most frequent reason for a license revocation. You will have a period of time to refile your bond. And I think I'm going to get into that a little later when we talk about steps um, to avoid noncompliance. One of the other reasons the FMC revokes, uh, and they don't do this often, it takes some fair, pretty egregious activities, but it has happened that um, Shipping Act violations cause the FMC uh, to revoke a license. And if um, an OTI has an issue with a revocation, they may ask for a hearing. Uh, there are some keys to avoiding rev revocation. Number one, work with your agent or your surety to keep your bonds up to date. If your bond lapses, restore coverage quickly, and the regulations require that it be dated back to the date prior bond was terminated. And as far as avoiding revocation um, for Shipping Act violations and other issues, I would always recommend that you seek guidance prior to engaging in ocean shipping transactions that are not clearly within the rules. And this happened many, many times in my 32 year career that companies would um, do something that was against the Shipping Act and tell me that they checked with the steamship line or they checked with a friend. Not advisable to do that. You need to check with the experts uh, before getting guidance. Or, or to get guidance. And I would request guidance in writing if it's coming from the FMC. And there are um, people that I directed to the uh, general counsel's office who did get um, legal opinions in writing. Five fifteen point thirty one of the reg regulations covers the general duties that apply to all OTIs. This is a brief summary of what's in 515.31. I again recommend that you read the regulation in its entirety. Compared to many other agencies, there is much less to read when dealing with the FMC regulations. It's very specialized. Um, changes happen, but they don't happen um, that frequently. So you don't have to worry about reading it every uh, updates every month and the way you find out about updates besides the seminar today is check uh, commission news releases and check their uh, Twitter um, account that's right on the website. This section covers uh, stationary and billing forms. Every OTI has stationary and billing forms. There are certain certifications that have to be on it. Very easy to follow. Um, and again, there, uh, we mentioned before that a licensee um, ha under certain conditions um, can use, um, can have an, well, of course, on any condition, um, a licensee's employee could use the license or a branch office or an agent. Agent doesn't use the license. Agent, of course, has to be acting on behalf they have to be a disclosed agent acting on behalf of the OTI, uh, and clearly so. But other than that, um, you have to be careful about the, not allowing the use of your license by another party, especially one that had their license revoked. Uh, 515.31G is uh, covers... Um, Request for documents or request for records and information um, by authorized personnel of the FMC. And for those who are located where an FMC field office is, which is everybody um, in Florida, Puerto Rico, South Carolina, uh, and Georgia, not that there are field offices everywhere, but the South Florida office covers 
those locations. And of course, especially if you're Miami, Fort Lauderdale, it's most likely any, any request would come from an area representative. The exception would be if the FMC in their routine compliance program sent out a compliance audit that would uh, come from headquarters. I just would point out one thing, when or if the FMC requests a document from you, especially if they come down in person and ask for a document and ask for it immediately and show you this section that you have to respond promptly, uh, I would point out that promptly does not mean immediately. Uh, if you have concerns about what the FMC is asking for, well, ask them to put it in writing. You certainly aren't going to have to rush to a warehouse and pull out boxes in storage to hand a document over immediately. You may want to have time to consult with uh, counsel. So in order to help your counsel out, ask that um, uh, whoever asks, if it's an area rep or someone from headquarters, ask um, th that the request be put in writing and then you could check with counsel to see if uh, you have any concerns. Five fifteen point thirty two applies uh, strictly to freight folders. They have their own duties separate from those of the NVOCC. And again, this is a summary. What is in this section uh, seeks to prevent unlicensed persons from benef benefiting financially from a transaction handled by a licensee, and it protects customers. This, these are my words, dishonest dealing and requires accuracy in doc preparation. One of the things that is required um, is a certification. I believe this goes on a billing form that states that you will provide a breakdown of charges to your customer so they know if you um, bill in bulk, lump sum bill, what it is you're being uh, invoiced for. Finally, we have record keeping requirements for all OTIs, NVOs and freight folders. Uh, they must keep correct and current all records and books of account in connection to its OTI business. Uh, this is a, the modern era. Many people do keep things electronically and that has, that's okay according to the regulations, but those records should be no less accessible than paper records. I don't recall 51533 having a, a um, amount of time record should be kept, but bear in mind there's a five-year statute, statute of limitations um, regarding prohibited acts and the FMC of course could go back and ask for documents going back that far, although it's not often something they're going to do, need to do. Now here is a, a section in uh, 515.33 uh, pertaining to record keeping requirements that apply only to ocean freight folders. They're required to have general financial data available. They have to have uh, separate shipment files for each shipment. All the documents that are prepared pursuant to that shipment have to be in that file. Anything processed by the ocean freight forwarder should be um, in that file. They have to also keep a list of receipts and disbursements. Um, one of the things that could be asked for uh, is uh, financial data, what's coming into the company, what's going out of the company. So any bank accounts, business accounts the company uses have to be available for inspection by, F by the FMC. Again, that would likely be um, an area representative. And this section of the regs clearly state has to be, these records have to be kept for five years. Now we're gonna move on to the prohibited acts. And the reason, of course, the FMC and the statute, the Shipping Act in 1984, as amended by the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 1998, has prohibited acts is because we would really be in compliance without the possibility of a penalty. So I'm gonna start in 46 U.S. Code 44.1102A, 
op, op, obtaining transportation at less than applicable rates. And this comes right from the, uh, right from, um, the statute. A person may not knowingly and willfully, directly or indirectly, by means of false billing, false classification, false weighing, false report of weight, and other things, um, meaning an unjust or unfair device or means, obtain or attempt to obtain ocean transportation for property at less than the rates or charges that would otherwise apply. One key word I would look at here is the word person. It is meant and is meant, it is broad and it's meant to be broad. There was actually a definition um, in uh, the definition section of the statute and the regulations that, not sure which, but it may be in both, that list what a person is defined as. It could be a corporation, an individual, and about six other things. Um, so bear in mind, this is a, a, a statute that could be looked at broadly. So this type of malpractice can encompass more than just a company. And it's also broad in terms of the devices or means used to get a less than applicable ocean freight rate. Uh, common over the years has been uh, a Mr. Declaration of the type of cargo to get a lower rate, Mr. Mr. Declaration of measurements of cargo, where a tariff for service contract calls for a um, freight in, a freight to be determined by um, size or weight of the cargo. You could use your imagination about what an other unjust or fair device means, but obviously one has to be very careful um, as an NVO, um, and this could apply certainly to NVOs uh, that are a shipper in their relationship with a vessel operating common carrier or a shipper uh, directly dealing with a vessel operating common carrier or dealing with um, an NVOCC. There are additional prohibited acts in uh, 46 USC 41104A. And this, these are the flip side of the uh, prohibited act I just, just discussed, which had to do with engaging a device or means to obtain a, a less than applicable ocean freight rate, which of course could be uh, something in a contract, which is, you know, not 90%, and I'm guessing the number, but very close of cargo moves under service contracts um, these days. Uh, or it may be under a tariff rate is that if that's what's applicable, um, just like a shipper should not be engaging in conduct to get a lower ocean freight rate, uh, a common carrier cannot be giving that um, ocean freight rate out that's less than applicable. So as you could see, and I believe this is uh, verbatim right from the statute, uh, common carrier, either alone or in conjunction with any other person, and I think there are some additional words in there, directly or indirectly may not allow a person to obtain transportation for property at less than the rates or charges established by the carrier in its tariff, tariff or service contract. Service contracts would only apply to vessel operating common carriers, but of course they, the exceptions would, could apply as well um, for NVOs as to rates they charge other than uh, tariff rates. Again, listed, false billing, false classification, false measurement, or any other unjust or unfair, unfair device or means. And second part is very similar, provide service in a line of trade that is not in accordance with rates, charges, classifications, and rules, uh, rules and practices contained in a tariff uh, that's published or a service contract um, entered into a chapter four or five of this title, unless exempted, accepted or exempted, and you're not often going to find um, anything that's exempted or accepted. One thing I would um, definitely pay attention to, and that is part of the changes, 46, C, um, uh, USC 41104 
Uh, that's the old section 11 of the um, uh, section 10, uh, was it 10 of, this, uh, of the prohibited acts, um, part 11, uh, knowingly and willfully accept cargo from or transport cargo for the account of a non-vessel operating common carrier that does not have a tariff as required by section uh, 40501 of this title or an ocean transportation intermediary that does not have a bond insurance or other surety as required by section 4902 of this title. Uh, this is part of what is new. And this is um, part of the Frank Lobiondo Coast Guard Act, uh, which is now part of, the, part of the prohibited acts. And it's also um, in the regulations under 515.27. And the reason it's important, I'm going to get into right after we talk about penalties. Monetary penalties are listed in 46 U.S. Code 41107. When I started back in 86, penalties were, uh, I believe, at or around $5,000 of not knowing and willful. But if knowing and willful, uh, they were not to exceed $25,000. By law, those are adjusted for in inflation. Right now, 12,000 12, plus um, per violation, unless it's knowing and willful, and it's $61,098 exactly. And what does that mean? Each shipment can be looked at as a violation. If you misdeclare 20 shipments and you benefit by paying less than the applicable freight rate, uh, that's 20 times 61,000. Is that 1.2 million plus? Um, does that mean you're going to pay that and go out of business? Well, uh, almost every case that I dealt with, with the exception of several, end up in um, negotiated uh, settlements and there are agreements that come out of most of those. They don't have to come. Parties don't always agree and then the commission could determine if they want to go to a formal investigation. Uh, but bear in mind, I would not panic if you get uh, what's known as a demand letter from the FMC. Um, know that you have the option of contacting the FMC and asking to negotiate a penalty or fighting it if you don't think you've done anything in violation. But of course, I would definitely consult with someone who has handled those matters before and has expertise in knowing what is and is not defendable um, as far as whether something's a prohibited act or not. Now I do wanna get into the changes. I think we're doing okay on time, so we'll be able to get to um, a short review of the FMC website. Uh, and that's, that's the Frank Lobiando Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2018. There were a number of changes other than the ones listed, but they really don't um, directly impact ocean transportation intermediaries, but these do. And the first one applies, when you first look at it, it sounds like it's going to apply to someone that does not yet have a license. It says, states that OTIs that advertise or hold themselves out as OTIs must be licensed and bonded. That is a significant change from the previous law that um, required doing acts, actually moving cargo uh, as an unlicensed OTI in order to be in violation and subject to penalty. That I believe is from the old section 19 uh, of the Shipping Act. Um, it's codified um, under, and I can't recall the section, but it's, uh, it's in 46 uh, USC. And, it, and therefore, if you are um, thinking of becoming a licensed OTI, do not get your advertising started early. And it's advertising could be on the web. Uh, it could be in one of the flyers you could pick up at almost, uh, uh, in the lobby of almost any office building in Florida. You know, handing out flyers, it could be a number of things, and that's what holding oneself out means. And uh, I don't know if this, these are, these are fairly new. These all um, were finalized and final rules done, I think, around March 
of this year. So it's hard to see how the FMC may um, interpret it or act according to this. But I would just be careful that um, if your bond is revoked and you were a licensee for many, many years or one year and you lose your bond, I suppose this will, could affect a company that forgets to take their website down for the period that they are um, not licensed until they get their bond back and their license reinstated. And if it's not done timely, you're going to have to apply all over again and the entire time you, you won't be licensed. And there's a second very significant change and this was mentioned before and it was the old 10B11 of the Shipping Act, the prohibition against knowingly and willfully accepting and carrying cargo for unlicensed unbonded OTIs includes both unlicensed freight forwarders and unlicensed unbonded NVOCCs. And to tell you how important it is, I'm gonna need a drink before I describe the, how much this could impact um, NVOCCs. And of course, steamship lines as well. Um, prior to this change, the language was read, um, re read that um, and a common carrier could not carry cargo for a company that did not have a license tariff and bond. Since freight folders do not have tariffs, are not required to have tariffs, um, every enforcement case I was aware of um, required that an NVO carry cargo for an unlicensed NVOCC, unlicensed would um, that doesn't include registered foreign NVOCCs, that's another matter. It does include them as far as receipt of unlicensed cargo. Um, so now the statute is different and the statute also makes it unlawful for an NVO or steamship line to take accept cargo from an unlicensed freight forwarder. And that really, really makes the burden a lot easier for the FMC to prove a case. Before, um, and usually it's the area representatives doing the investigating, they are going to have to put together proof through documentation that a company's acting as an NVOCC, taking common carrier responsibility for the shipment and otherwise meeting the definition of what an NVOCC is. If they couldn't prove that, very often the case wouldn't be um, prosecuted by the FMC. But now it seems all you're going to have to, the FMC will have to show is you dealt with somebody that didn't have a license, didn't own the cargo, and was booking the cargo with you. That's what I would interpret this to be. Uh, I don't believe, at least publicly, I have not seen a single um, press release on any penalties. Uh, so it's hard to say how it will carry out, but that certainly would be the logical reading of this change to the statute. Uh, and also it's, it's uh, a change in the regulations. Um, one other change deals with agents and it makes clear that OTI licensing and responsi financial responsibility requirements do not apply to disclosed agents of OTIs. And the key word is disclosed uh, for many years, ever since um, a DC appellate court case uh, allowed uh, or precluded really the FMC from going after an, an agent of an OTI for unlicensed activity. Um, companies came to me, showed me uh, written OTI agent agreements. Um, and many of them were written very well. There was only one problem with it. The agent wasn't following the terms of the agreement. They were holding themselves out as uh, an NVOCC. Their customers were receiving documentation directly from them indicating um, common carrier responsibility was taken on by that company that really wasn't an agent uh, but really in business for themselves, taking cargo from their customers and then um, booking that cargo with what was supposed to be their principal, but was really the NVO uh, that they were acting as a shipper 
with. So in order to be um, compliant, uh, you have to, if you are an agent, be disclosed as an agent for that particular OTI. If you want to, there's no requirement that a uh, agent principal agreement be in writing. I certainly would look into it and suggest it, but if you do, make sure that you the agreement is written properly to keep you in compliance um, and that you follow the terms of that agreement. So I mentioned this before, the most important thing is there are changes, how is it gonna affect you if you are a licensed OTI? The FMC has less of a burden in showing that an NVOCC is in violation of carrying cargo for an unlicensed and bonded OTI. Uh, there's one other thing uh, I didn't mention before. Uh, there was a um, regulation in place prior to 2020 that required foreign registered NVOs, and those are the NVOCCs that are overseas that chose not to be licensed, but um, instead posted a double bond and registered with the NVO, they were required to use a licensed OTI to act as their agent. Um, now, those foreign registered NVOs do not need to use a licensed OTI in the US to act as agent. I, uh, the FMC, whenever they propose a rule, has a comment period. I believe only one comment came in and that comment asked the question, I think it's a legitimate question, will these agents re timely respond to the FMC? They're not licensed. Uh, and in, in general, the FMC has the leverage uh, over a licensed uh, OTI more than an unlicensed one because there is no bond and the bond can be used to pay penalties. So um, they will not have the FMC, somebody with a license in the US to go after unless the foreign NVO, foreign registered NVO chooses to use a licensee. And therefore the question was asked, will they timely respond to the FMC for any, uh, in response to any inquiries? I put together a list here that you can take a look at uh, that I entitled Compliance Made Easy. And the reason I put it here is compared to the regulations in the statute in 1984, compared even to the changes in the uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 1998, compliance is not that difficult. And the reason it's not is the FMC commission uh, has um, taken the stand that a lot of uh, deregulation has been required over years to ease the burden on uh, companies that the FMC regulates. So if it's easy, you can still, how can you still end up getting a penalty? How could you get investigated? And I would always say, start with the low hanging fruit, whatever, is easy to fix, easy to stay in compliance with, has to be stressed. That's where you would start any compliance program. Um, easy cases, and I'm gonna mention those, are the path of least resistance for the FMC field and the FMC Bureau of Enforcement. It's not to say anything negative about the field of the Bureau of Enforcement. It's true with any government agency. This, you know, if, if a penalty is something, a prohibited act is something they are concerned about, um, and it's easy for them to prove, that of course can happen. Uh, something that started happening about three years ago were um, penalties given to licensed OTIs that were operating without a qualifying individual for over one year. Qualifying individuals get fired. Qualifying individuals quit and qualifying individuals get sick and sometimes pass away. And I believe it's uh, a, an application, an FMC 18 with a replacement qualifying individual has to be submitted to the FMC within 30 days. That is something that should be easy enough. You lose your QI, um, apply for a change. Now, I believe, my reading of the regulation is you have to be operating without a QI for over one year 
if you apply for that, uh, that change and the FMC uh, takes time responding, or if you're asked, uh, told that the QI doesn't meet the requirements and then you replace him, I don't know if that's the type of case they go after. But if you've done nothing, once your qualifying individual left and more than a year has gone by, um, then the FMC policy then, um, and that you could see, this is public knowledge, was right in the press releases, was that one year period of time. Another uh, low hanging fruit for the FMC uh, that uh, enables them to penalize companies is uh, penalized specifically NBOs and steamship lines that carrying cargo for an unlicensed OTI. Again, that's going to be easier than ever because the FMC will not have the burden of proving that OTI was acting as an NBO. They just need to prove they're acting as either a forwarder or an NBO CC. Now, they're easy to penalize, of course. It doesn't require a lengthy or difficult investigation to prove either one of those, um, but they're very easy to avoid. Your qualifying individual leaves, file for a replacement, uh, and the second one, carrying cargo for unlicensed OTIs is simple. Know who your customer is. If you knew or you should have known, the FMC can seek a penalty and you can't really run from that penalty because your bond, uh, one of the terms of the bond is to pay off FMC penalties. So that is something that you really have to keep in mind. And I, I, I've talked to many people in the industry and I've told them over the years, if I could walk in your office, look at one or, one or two files and determine that your customer that you're carrying cargo for is an unlicensed OTI, uh, you should be able to do that fairly easy as well as, as an NVOCC. How do, I have a question for Andrew. How do you, how do, how does the um, NVOCC look that up? What is the easiest way to find that out about their client? There is a list that is, um, when I was there, they were updating um, pretty much daily. Some things could fall through the cracks. If there was a bond revocation, it was sitting on someone's desk who was not in for the day. It may take a while to uh, get the license, a day or two to get it activated, but there is one stop shopping. There is one stop location on the FMC website by clicking right on the homepage for a list of licensed OTIs and putting their name in. Um, so that's something that um, you certainly can take, um, take a look at. And how often to should determine. the NBOCC check on that? How often? Once a year? Well, they're not, in, in, they, the FMC isn't going to uh, likely go after anybody who was carrying cargo and somebody um, lost their license uh, quickly. But for steamship lines, it's certainly required whenever there is an amendment to a service contract. And I would look at similar things for NBOs with NRAs being offered, NSAs being offered, um, any, any change in, in uh, dealing with a company should kind of set off an, um, the idea that it's time to check if they're still licensed, but it's easy to do periodically. It takes a matter of minutes. Um, if it's monthly, if it's, it, it, although it may not list that in the regs, it keeps you safe. So I continue on my list of what you should do to make compliance easy. And for those, I know many members are probably on this webinar, but for those who are considering it, I could say something that I never used to be able to say when I was a government employee, and that is to join the Florida Custom Brokers and Freight Voters Association. I couldn't take sides then. There were different associations around the country and a national but I've always believed that this organization is an incredible asset to those who are in the industry and those seeking to be in the, in the industry, putting on events like this, being there uh, for their members, uh, putting on larger events. And I haven't asked, but I wonder how that'll work out in the uh, era of COVID-19. They are a wonderful organization 
that puts out newsletters and updates and, and, and they're a great asset to anybody who wants to be or is in this in ocean transportation industry. Also, I would regularly review the FMC website um, for changes, for press releases. You can look at, um, of course, verification of a, uh, a licensed, uh, licensed status of an OTI. And uh, finally, always ask before you act. If you are in the least bit concerned, um, some activity or venture that you are about to engage in uh, is a violation of the Shipping Act, um, you can, I would actually, you and can, I say you should seek advice on that first. I have put up my contact information, both my um, email and phone number. Feel free to give me a call um, if you uh, have any concerns or any questions. Well, I think we're out of time, but do I have two minutes to do a quick review of the FMC website? Sorry. You know, I think we started. Okay. Uh, a little bit off the wall. Okay, now I have to figure out how to get to it. So <laughs> I think I'm gonna wait for, let's see. Megan. Megan. I know she told me what to do and I already forgot. So <laughs> let's see. I don't want to hit the wrong button. I made a career out of doing that at the FMC. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. Going to just um, go over the website, which is really well uh, put together. It's very customer friendly and most of everything you need to find out, you can start easily right on the homepage. There is not a lot of searching to do. Um, one of the things I mentioned before, go to the news releases. News releases are gonna show you what's happening with, F with commission meetings of the uh, commission and that's where Usually it goes on, there it is. Um, that's where um, a lot happens, including um, the commission's uh, desire to change certain regulations. And then when changes um, are ready to be made, there'll be a proposed rule issued, usually, or I believe always after a comment period. And you'll have interviews, you could see interviews of the commissioners, and the chairman to know what they are thinking. Um, statutes and the regulation, years ago, you had to pay for it. Uh, now by uh, going to the US government printing office, here it is right there. Uh, the Shipping Act of 1984 is right here. The regulations 46 CFR 500 are here. You could even go to historical versions um, if you feel like it and see what changes have taken place over the years to make this um, industry, um, as far as FMC regulation go, much less regulation, much less regulated with much more flexibility. Um, databases, here, here we go, go to databases right at the top and you could see the list of FMC licensed and bonded OTIs, which could help you verify you're dealing with a, um, a licensed um, entity. One thing I have to mention about receiving cargo um, from licensed, uh, unlicensed OTIs, be they freight forwarders or uh, NVOs, one thing to always be concerned, out, concerned about is that whoever's tenory to you in the capacity of a shipper um, should be an NVOCC and forwarders should be booking it um, with you with the name of the actual shipper in the shipper box. On a, um, on a bill of lading for an NVO or a steamship line, since NVOs could co-load, you may have the, another NVO in the shipper box. Um, and the same with the steamship line for freight forwarders. If they're booking cargo with you, the only time their name should be in there. I believe the regulation, if, 
uh, was uh, as agent for with a disclosed shipper principal. And there were a number of reasons um, that forwarders have to do that especially for constantly generated cargo where there, where there are quite a, a few shippers um, that they're booking cargo for. Um, Andy, we have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. And one of them I think is, is fitting now, but Luis Ruben is asking if you apply for an FMC license and then you don't use it for some time, will it still be active? Uh, it's, if, as long as your bond's in effect, it, it will be active. Um, there was a time without, and I don't know if the FMC is doing that now with all the changes, it's too soon. There were show cause orders uh, sent out for companies, for NVOs that didn't make any change to their tariff back in the days of tariffs um, since NRAs, and I believe even no longer NSAs, NRAs never had to be filed, NSAs used to be, I don't believe they have anymore. Those changes the FMC is not looking for, but there were show cause orders to show why your license shouldn't be revoked then. I don't know um, because of all the changes how it'll work now, but generally um, that didn't even happen often back uh, before these changes. Uh, but um, there really isn't a reason to do it because you're going to be paying for bond coverage and many of these in, in insurance company that represent the sureties they're not just going to want to sell you a bond. They're going to, um, and I've heard that, you know, they may make it contingent upon approval of the bond is other types of insurance like errors and omissions policies that are going to cost money. So if you're not using it, why not wait? And if there's a legitimate reason you have why you want to have it now, maybe you want to just have it set up just in case you want to go quickly. I understand doing it that way. And it really shouldn't be a problem um, if you keep your um, bond up to date. Okay. And then um, Mauricio is asking if there's any logic behind which companies are audited by the FMC um, besides from complaints. So are they, are they randomly selected? Is there a certain pattern? Well, I can tell you what I did and um, Obviously, it probably depends on the area representative. Area representatives do have a lot of discretion. I obviously knew a lot of people in this industry and still do, and I responded to complaints. Uh, I tried to make my cases um, about uh, activities or malpractice that gave a, um, an OTI or a steamship line uh, a pronounced advantage over the competition. Um, so for me, it was complaints. Sometimes those complaints could be referred by headquarters if a complaint was made to them, but more often than not, the complaints would come to me, um, often from people I, um, who knew me and trusted me because one thing you don't wanna have happen is to tell anybody you're investigating the source of that investigation. Um, so you have to have a trust relationship. Um, and uh, FMC does have a routine compliance program. Uh, I don't know if it was filmed, but the uh, FCBF had a seminar in 2018, I believe, um, where the head of the Bureau of Enforcement, Ben Trogdon, and he's still the head of the Bureau of Enforcement, came down and discussed the routine compliance program. And it's not designed to be an investigative tool. I don't believe anywhere, it, you're not gonna find that in writing, but that generally is um, the policy, it has been the policy. I've always found in my 32 years, the FMC um, to be uh, an, um, an, uh, an agency that wants to work with the industry uh, and isn't looking uh, to nitpick about a penalty. They're looking for an activity that has gone on um, more than just a short period of time. They're looking for a pattern of activities. So I would say uh, most likely most of the cases are going to be um, complaint driven. I can tell you that I'm sure the FMC, uh, especially now you have um, nine area representatives and the uh, I would say six or seven have two years or less with the FMC maybe two years or less even dealing with the shipping industry. 
I met most of them. They're very bright and uh, they work hard and they are learning quickly, but of course they haven't developed contacts yet. And, but they are very good with databases, databases like data mine. And there is nothing in the statute that prevents them from doing routine audits based upon um, activities that they know uh, are a big source of violation. Some years back, and you could see a lot of penalties on it, um, there were many cases made against um, NVOs uh, that signed uh, what were known as named account contracts where they could only um, ship cargo for certain named counts that were listed in the contract, but they'd ship for other companies. That could be determined using databases. So um, the FMC, the area reps didn't have to go um, get information directly. They had information that that was a common violation. It would be in a routine manner that they can find those who appeared to be in violation and then open an investigation. Sure. Thank you for that. And that's, we have time for one more question. Um, and then any other questions, guys, feel free to email them to us. You have Andy's contact information. You also have education at fcbf.com uh, for any other questions. And we will be sending you these slides afterwards so you can go through them uh, and take your time doing so. Um, but the last question we have is that I've heard through the rumor mill that there's no more tariff filing as of 2021. Is this true? Do you know well, anything about that? I, I, I would not believe anything in the rumor mill. Um, the industry, those uh, who have to publish tariffs, um, meaning the NVOs and the steamship lines, uh, through various organizations, they have been pushing for this. Uh, I know there was talk at the FMC that it may not even be able to be done through a, um, a commission change to the regulations. So through, in other words, through a proposed rule, it may have to go um, into the, the change has to take place by Congress, um, changing the statute that requires it. Uh, I, it is purely a rumor and you cannot trust rumors because it's going to take the consensus of the commission and there's an election in November and the chairman may change if a Democrat wins, um, the commission may change, people come and go and whatever opinions they hold now may change by the time the commission, um, if they get around to looking at it uh, at any point, looks at it. So I would not base your conduct on that. Um, very quickly, actually, I have one more thing I want to go over and that's fact finding 29, if we have time for a second. Um, we have like maybe just a few seconds. Let's we're, do that quickly running over time. That's, that's the most important, that's important. I, um, You'll see on the news release is actually on the home page that the FMC has um, a fact finding investigation going on um, right now called Fact Finding 29, and it's headed by uh, Commissioner um, Rebecca Dye. And I've known Commissioner Dye for uh, many years. Had some time, uh, a, a few times we got we did get to talk about. Um, her view of the uh, how the industry uh, and the FMC should work together. She believes in collaborative efforts. In fact, Finding 29 is looking to see problems in the supply chain, uh, problems with cargo storage because of COVID-19. Um, she wants that effort to be collab collaborative and that's why uh, the fact finding allowed her um, to form um, teams, innovation teams, uh, with representatives from the industry and the FMC participate so they can work together to come up with solutions to problems. So one of those solutions could be making sure that uh, cargo needed um, for first responders uh, gets cleared quickly, et cetera. So that's something you may want to take a look at and it's right on the homepage, a link to that. Excellent. It is, um, so it is, they have a big call to action box right there on the front of the fmc.gov website that can take you to see fact finding 29 and 30. Um, those are ongoing investigations. And as soon as we get more information, we will definitely share that with all of you. Um, but Andy, thank you. Wow. You're welcome. Very, it's very been so quickly, thorough. Very quickly, if you did want to respond, if even if you're not on an innovation team, um, 
FF29 at FMC.gov is going to go um, to um, the FMC and Commissioner Dye, one of the staff can take a look at any suggestions you have. Excellent, so I've typed that inbox into the chat so you can all see if you have any input on that, that current uh, fact finding. We'll get you through it. So uh, guys, I know that we've gone over just a few minutes, but thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Andy, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience. Thank you so uh, much for having me. No, it's definitely our pleasure and honor to be able to count on your expertise after so many years of serving on the commission. Uh, this is absolutely fantastic. So we will be sharing uh, Andy's slides with you all so you can review those and share them with your team if you need to. Um, compliance is our biggest interest in making sure that you all have access to the resources that you need in order to operate appropriately uh, with regards to the law. So I will end it there and we'll send this out before the end of the week, okay? Excellent, Andy, thank you so much. Guys, thanks, have a great You're rest welcome of the day. And thank you and thank everyone for uh, tuning in. And happy 4th of July. Happy 4th, happy of, 4th July. of July. Excellent, thank you. Be safe, everyone.